Hello, inventors. I'm so glad to be here today virtually, seeing so many young people feeling excited about STEM. Uh, my name is Emmy Kelly, and that is me in that photo with the Perseverance rover, which just landed on Mars this past February. I am a mechatronics engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, in Pasadena, California. But I grew up in the Green Mountains of Vermont, right next to you guys. Uh, for those of you who don't know, JPL is a NASA facility that's responsible for most of the United States' robotic space missions. So we've built spacecrafts that have gone to places like Jupiter and Saturn, as well as all of the Mars rovers, uh, like Perseverance. We also built Ingenuity, a helicopter that went to Mars with Perseverance, and just this past month became the first aircraft to fly on a different planet. I was a lot like you when I was a kid, interested and excited by STEM. I fell in love with space when I was young, which led me to be interested in things like astronomy and physics. But when I was 14 years old, I watched the Curiosity rover land on Mars, and that's when I got really excited about the idea of invention. I could not believe that people were able to build a car-sized robot, put it on top of a rocket, shoot that rocket to Mars, and somehow manage to safely land that robot on the surface of a different planet. And I knew then that I wanted to be just like the engineers who made that incredible feat happen. So in high school, I started working towards this goal. I worked hard in my math and science classes. I joined engineering camps and programs where I started to learn what engineering was about. I even got to work on propulsion systems as an intern at the University of Vermont. And eventually, after I graduated high school, I decided to go to Northeastern University, where I studied to become a mechanical engineer. One of the first things I did at Northeastern was go to a research fair. This is where professors will advertise the cool new things in STEM that they're working on in order to recruit students to come and help on the projects. One professor was putting together a team to compete in the Mars Ice Challenge, which was a competition run by NASA. Needless to say, this immediately caught my eye. So um, in order to understand what this competition is about, I need to tell you a little bit about Mars. So because of Mars's atmosphere and the temperature, liquid water can't exist on the surface. However, scientists are pretty sure there's a lot of places on Mars where if you dig down only a couple of feet, you'll find these huge deposits of frozen water or ice. So the goal of this challenge was to build a robot that could dig through the dirt to reach these ice deposits and then collect the ice, melt it, and filter it to produce water. This way in the future, when we send astronauts to Mars, they can have a source of clean, usable water right there. We started this competition and nobody had built anything like this robot before. People were just starting to think about how to solve this problem. So we needed to invent something totally new. We were given $10,000 and six months to come up with our idea, figure out how to build it and create a real actual working robot. And then at the end of that six months, we, along with nine other competing teams, would travel to NASA's Langley Research Center in Virginia to test our robot in a mock-up, or what engineers call a test bed, of what those dirt and ice deposits might actually look like on Mars. So the Mars Ice Challenge was the first time I had ever built a robot. To be honest, I had barely built anything up to that point. I had to learn a lot of new things. Technical skills, like how to design parts and choose the right screws, as well as non-technical skills, like how to put your ideas out there and explain them well. I had to learn how to invent something. And the hardest thing for me to learn were those non-technical skills, how to share your ideas with people. This is a critical part of the invention process, especially when you're working in a team. Bouncing ideas off of each other, brainstorming, it all contributes to creating something better than you can make on your own. But it also takes a lot of courage to say what you think. Sometimes there's fear that people won't like your idea, that they'll say it's bad, or even worse, that they'll say that you're a bad inventor. But those fears may feel real, but they're not true. And here's why. Bad ideas are a huge, wonderful, important part of inventing. And I have a story about it to prove my point. One of my team members, Ben, on the Mars Ice Challenge, bought a part that he thought we could use on our robot. But when the part came, it was all wrong. Not only was it too stiff, but it was also way too big and heavy. There was 
no way we could use it. He must have forgotten to check the diameter of the part when he bought it, and worst of all, it was really expensive. But instead of being mad at him, telling him he made a bad decision, and, and getting upset, we decided to do something else. So I grabbed a cardboard box, put the part he'd ordered inside, and wrote in big block letters, box of shame, and then congratulated him for the honor of getting a part into the box of shame. Now, box of shame might sound like a negative thing. Who would want to be shamed for something? But getting to put something in the box of shame was a good thing. The name was more of a teasing joke. We wanted our team to feel comfortable making mistakes, even excited about making mistakes. When someone messed up or had an idea that didn't work or catastrophically failed, instead of getting upset about it, we'd congratulate our team member for getting another item in the box of shame. Then we'd laugh about it and move on. My time to get something in the box of shame was not long after Ben. I was working on making a tool to melt the ice, a little metal tube filled with heaters. I wanted to retain as much heat in the tube as I could, so I figured I'd glue some heaters to the inside of the tube and then fill the extra space with a bit of insulation. I built my prototype, turned it on, and all seemed to be well. So I started to run some tests with it. Halfway through testing, I realized something smelled a bit funny. I looked down and saw that the prototype was smoking. I quickly turned it off and my teammate ran to the fire extinguisher. We knew our safety protocols. Uh, Luckily, nothing was on fire and we didn't have to use it, but my prototype was ruined. <laughs> As you can see in the photo, the insulation inside was this charred, melted mess. It turned out that the resistors got a lot hotter than I was expecting, and the insulation just couldn't handle it. The worst part was that my teammate thought that exactly this would happen, but I didn't believe them, so I tried it anyway. But instead of that team member saying, I told you so, we laughed about my mishap and then threw the part into the box of shame. <laughs> now, having a bad idea is great, but one of the hardest things in inventing is when it feels like none of your ideas are working. About five months into working on the Mars Ice Challenge, things were going well. Our robot, named Paws, was all built and working, so we started to test. We would spend hours drilling into dirt and ice, trying to figure out the best way to do it. How fast to spin the drill, how deep to drill at once, and how quickly could we melt the ice. It was during this testing that we ran into our biggest problem, the hole collapsing. So the idea behind pause was to drill a hole through the dirt until it reached the top of the ice. Then we'd take the drill out and put a new tool into the hole that would melt the ice and then pump up the water. The problem was that this hole was unstable, and as you can see in the photo, when we removed the drill, loose dirt would fall back into the hole, covering the ice, which made it impossible to get our melting tool to the surface of the ice. Next, we tried designing new drill bits. We thought that we could design a bit that would do a better job of making a stable hole, something that would really pack dirt into the sides more tightly. We designed a lot of new bits, as you can see in the photo, and we kept testing them, but none seemed to be doing what we wanted them to do. At this point, we were running out of time and needed a solution. My teammates wanted to keep working on the bits, but I thought that we weren't going to be able to design something that worked on time. This is a really hard question. How do you know when to give up on an idea that's not working? This was the time that things got the most heated between me and my teammates. Me wanting to abandon designing new bits and my teammates wanting to continue. In times like that, you really have to sit down and be objective. It's sometimes hard to let go of an idea you believe in and have worked on. I knew that if we had more time and more resources, we could design a bit that would do exactly what we wanted but we didn't have that time or those resources. And the truth is that that's how a lot of engineering decisions are made. With enough time and resources, we can design and build just about anything, but we're always limited by something. In the end, my team agreed with me that we didn't have time to keep designing and testing new drill bits. So we ended up trying out different things with our drill procedure seeing if we could get a better hole by changing the order that we did things in or drilling faster or for longer. 
We ended up finding that because the tip of our drill was heated, if we let it sitting on the top of the ice for a while, we could create enough water that the bottom of our hole would become muddy and wet. And when we pulled the drill out of that hole, the mud would smear on the walls and re-solidifying, making a really stable hole. And as you can see in this photo, if you look all the way down to the bottom of the hole, there's a nice clear bit of ice that we could access with our melting tool. It was a perfect solution and we never had to build anything new. After we solved our collapsing hole problem, we were ready to go compete. Here's a picture of our finished robot on the test bed at Langley. We spent two days in a humid airplane hangar at NASA Langley competing with other teams to see who could collect the most water. It was a long, stressful two days full of troubleshooting more problems and rapidly fixing things that broke. But in the end, our hard work paid off and we ended up winning the competition, having collected about four liters of water. And even more excitingly than winning that competition, my experience working on the Mars Ice Challenge led me to getting hired as an intern at JPL, the place that I had wanted to work ever since I watched the Curiosity rover land on Mars back when I was 14 years old. As you can imagine, I learned even more about invention during my time interning at JPL, and I'm still learning even more now, three years later as a full-time engineer here. A lot of what I've learned is technical, how to do structural calculations and design more complex machines. But I've also learned just how many people it takes to create something like the Perseverance rover. Not just engineers and scientists, but artists and business people, filmmakers and custodians, technicians and baristas. JPL is full of people who do all types of jobs, but we're all united in our excitement about creating spacecrafts to explore the solar system. But I think the most important and most surprising thing that I've learned at JPL is that the work we do here really isn't that different from the work I did on the Mars Ice Challenge or the work that you all are doing participating in the Young Inventors Program. Sure, the stakes are a bit higher at JPL. Landing a rover on Mars isn't easy. And yes, we have a much bigger budget. But in the end, we're still inventing things that have never been made before. Your idea on how to tunnel through the ice sheets of Europa or land a spacecraft on the surface of Pluto or create a blimp to sail in the atmosphere of Venus is just as valid as mine. Nobody's done it before, so we have no idea what the best way to do it is. And sometimes the wildest sounding ideas end up being the ones that get built and flown. So I encourage you to start thinking about these kinds of problems now because we need people like you not just at JPL and NASA, but in fields all across the world. We need people who understand these difficulties of inventing something new, and people who rise to that challenge with eagerness and excitement. So thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you all go forth from this talk really excited to keep on inventing things.